before we begin, uh, I have just a few uh, few messages uh, for you. Um, the first one is that when we have such a, a, a big event that we had today, uh, it has been very important for us to have uh, uh, sponsors. And uh, I would just like to say that that uh, uh, the, the Holmbo Symposium and uh, this year has been sponsored by uh, uh, the Abel Board as usual. But we also had some other sponsors uh, like the, the Nas National Center for Mathematics Education, Mathematics Center and uh, uh, the Cent uh, National Center for Science Recruitment, Realfax Recruiting, uh, and also the Center of uh, Excellent Education called uh, Matrik in uh, Kristiansand. They have all been uh, sponsoring this, uh, this uh, event. Um, then uh, I would like to also uh, ask you something uh, to get some response for you, from you on one thing. Uh, I think that most of you are aware that there is going to be also uh, lectures at the uh, University of Oslo tomorrow between 10 and 12. So uh, uh, could we just uh, could I just ask you to raise a hand if you plan to go to the to the event tomorrow, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now uh, it is, uh, we have heard already several times that we have a very uh, important guest uh, today, uh, and that is uh, Professor Joe Bowler from Stanford uh, University. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah. I think this uh, applause uh, says uh, more than a thousand words, and uh, I don't want to make a fool of myself of, uh, of uh, introducing uh, uh, Joe uh, with, with, with more than that. So I just say, uh, please, uh, Joe, thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here in Norway and to see you all. I'm really inspired by Hanan and what she's doing, and it's uh, been a wonderful morning. Can I ask here, uh, who teaches mathematics that's sitting here? All right, excellent. Um, so I am a professor at Stanford. I am from England, um, so a fellow European, although I reside in sunny California these days. But um, what I want to talk to you about today is the importance of the new work we have in mathematics, in learning, and in neuroscience. And I'm really working at the sort of intersection of those three areas now and doing that to really, um, for a couple of reasons. One is to dispel some really damaging myths that are out there that hold children back, all ages of learner back, on a daily basis. And in dispelling those myths, um, we're able to change people's relationship with mathematics. Many people have a damaged relationship with maths, and um, so I want to share some of the very important work with you today. And the first myth that we work hard to dispel, and I don't know how strong this myth is here in Norway, but is the idea that you're born with a maths brain or you're not. Um, it turns out we have a wealth of evidence from brain science that nobody is born with a maths brain. Uh, nobody's born without one, and everybody's brains can grow and change to learn any level um, of school mathematics. And uh, some things about the brain that we know, we know that the brain is made up of over 100 billion neurons and several thousand connections between them, and it is our most changeable organ in the body. And the, the way that people grow a mathematics brain and the way that they learn mathematics as I said, it's not from a genetic uh, predisposition, but the process works like this. When you learn a new idea in mathematics, something happens in your brain, and that is one of three things happen. One thing that can happen is a new pathway forms in the brain. When you learn something at first, it's a very delicate little pathway, but the more you learn and go back to an idea, the deeper that pathway becomes until it becomes a permanent brain pathway that you keep using or you may strengthen a pathway that you already have in the brain and make it deeper and firmer, or you may connect different pathways in the brain. But these three processes of forming, strengthening, and connecting brain pathways are the way that people learn mathematics and develop mathematical ideas um, in the brain. 
And this is what's known as brain plasticity. Some of the most important evidence of this came from my hometown of London a few years ago. And I'm sure many of you have traveled um, in a black cab in London. If you haven't, they are very professional cab service. Um, but you may not have known how highly qualified the drivers need to be. It turns out to become a black cab driver you study for four, five, six years. And at the end of that time, you take a test, which is beautifully called the knowledge. And to pass the knowledge, you have to have memorized 25,000 streets and 20,000 landmarks in central London and every connection between them. The drivers learn this from traveling around London. They don't sit and try and memorize this, but um, it's known as one of the world's most difficult tests. The average amount of time it takes to pass the knowledge is 12 times. And uh, the brain scientists decided to study the brains of black cab drivers, and they found that at the end of their training period, they had a larger hippocampus in the brain. This is a very important area for mathematics. They also found that when people retired many years later and stopped being cab drivers, the hippocampus shrinks back down again. Not from age, that's the good news, but um, just from not using those pathways anymore. And then a really important study I wanted to share with you comes from Stanford, a uh, very recent study, and it is this one. They brought into the laboratories children between the ages of seven and nine years. And half of the children have been diagnosed in their school as having mathematics learning disabilities, and half of them are regular performers. Um, they put brain scans, they had these children do mathematics under brain scans, and they found, lo and behold, actual brain differences, with the children with the disability ha actually had more brain activity than the other children. More of their brain was lighting up. The top, if you can see it there, um, row of brains was the children with the so-called learning disabilities. Um, but you don't want every area of your brain lighting up when you work on a maths problem. And the researchers worked with both groups of students for eight weeks, giving them tutoring. At the end of that eight-week period, not only did both groups have the same achievement, but the exact same brain functioning. This is one of many studies that shows that brains change dramatically. And even in an eight-week period, you can completely level the playing field um, with students. So um, it turns out people are very interested in how do you become more intelligent, how do you become a genius even. And what we now know, and this is very recent research, is that this actually comes um, from having more connections be in between pathways in your brain. People have studied the brain of Einstein and others who they regard as a genius. They find this, it's not a bigger brain, but there's more connecting going on. And um, <coughs> there was a very interesting article that came out just a few weeks ago in the National Geographic called What Makes a Genius? And they really thought, well, there are a few people in the world that they regard to be a genius, and how does that happen? And they found very, very rarely does it have anything to do with parents. Genius children don't come from genius parents. Um, but again, they, when they studied brain activity, what they find is there's more brain connections going on in these amazingly uh, developed people. And um, the difference is very clear, more communication going on between areas of the brain. So I will be showing you how we, how we develop that communication in a moment in mathematics. Um, but the evidence is very clear that you may be born with small differences in brains, but those differences are eclipsed by the millions of opportunities that happen in our lifetime. And a very important change for us to get to teachers and to parents is for them to understand that everybody is capable of high level learning um, and all students have the potential to reach the highest levels in school with the right teaching and the right messages. So one of the myths we're trying to dispel is the idea of a math brain, or a maths brain. The other myth um, I learned from my Stanford students. I teach undergrads at Stanford, and I often say to them, are you going to take more mathematics courses at Stanford? And many of them have said to me, 
I'll take courses until I hit my wall. And I say to them, your wall, what's that? And they say, you know, everybody has a wall. You can go so far until you hit your wall. Well, it turns out there is no wall. <laughs> this is an American uh, character called Kool-Aid Man uh, helping us dispel this myth, which is a very real myth. I was presenting to Cornell's math department a few uh, months ago, and one of the mathematicians put her hand up when I was talking and said, are you telling me there is no wall? Because I worked on a math problem for a year, and then I just gave up on it because I decided I could never solve it. I said, yes, I am saying that. There is no wall. So um, it turns out we know that different teachers in the universities and the schools have different ideas about kids. And there's a really clear different dimension. And we find that amongst some teachers, they really think their job is to find those kids who are math, uh, people who have a math brain, and, and that's how they orient their teaching. Other teachers, like Hanan, know that all students have the potential. Um, and it turns out that which of those beliefs you have as a teacher will change what happens for students in classrooms. So I wanted to share with you one study that shows this amongst university teachers. And it was a really interesting study where they, fa they asked different university faculty in the US how much they believed in the idea of a gift, that to do well in their field, you had to have a gift. And this is what they found, that the more, um, and this was published in Premier Journal, Science, they found that the more any field valued the idea of giftedness, the fewer women and the fewer African-American students were in that field. And that held across all 30 academic fields they looked at. So let's have a little look at those fields. Um, the top graph is STEM subjects, and the lower graph is uh, humanities subjects. And the axis, the x-axis, tells you how much professors believed in the gift, the idea of the gift. And the y-axis tells you the proportion of women in the field. So you may be able to tell, you may be able to see, that on the STEM graph, math is right out there. More maths professors believe that you have to have a gift than any other of those STEM subjects. It, interestingly, if you look at the humanities subjects, you see philosophy is also right out there. The philosophy professors believe you have to have a gift to learn philosophy. Um, also interesting, if you look on the STEM graph, the neuroscientists are right at the other end. They know there is no gift, so um, <laughs> they don't believe in the, in the gift. But... Um, we know that those beliefs, we see how they're affecting students, and you have to think, if this is how much university professors' beliefs impact students, what do these ideas do to young children? Um, so another really interesting study showing us the impact of beliefs. It was a study that was done with high school English students. Big experimental study with hundreds of students in two groups. Everybody wrote an essay for their teacher. Everybody received critical diagnostic feedback. But for half of the students, at the end of their teacher feedback, there was an extra sentence. And the students were randomly assigned the extra sentence. Teachers didn't know who got it. But the kids who got the extra sentence did significantly better a whole year later, particularly the students of color. So what was that extra sentence, you're probably wondering. At the end of the teacher's feedback, for half of the students, it said this. I am giving you this feedback because I believe in you. And the kids who read that at the end of their feedback did significantly better a year later. So it's pretty amazing. And when I present this to teachers in the US, I say, you know, I'm not saying this, so you put at the end of every student's feedback, I'm giving you this feedback because I believe in you. One teacher said, we don't put it on a stamp. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't put it on a stamp. But, um, but, so, but I say, it, 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 your words are really important to students, and we can be saying to them all the time, I know you can do this. I believe in you. You can learn anything. Those are important words. So what happens when teachers believe? That changes a lot. Um, what happens when students believe in themselves? That also changes a lot. And we've already heard a little bit about mindset from um, Hanan. And, and mindset, uh, it turns out, is, 
a very well-developed field of research from Carol Dweck. And it shows that everybody has a mindset. You do, students do, I do. And if you have a growth mindset, you believe that you can learn anything. But if you have a fixed mindset, you believe your intelligence is more or less fixed. And it turns out that um, students, uh, many students believe that their intelligence in, in mathematics is fixed. They have more fixed mindsets about math than any other subject. And um, those mindsets matter a lot. And this graph shows you students going through seventh and eighth grade with the same teachers. The only difference between them was their beliefs about themselves, their mindset. And you see the kids with a fixed mindset, uh, uh, their achievement stays the same, but kids with a growth mindset are going onwards and upwards all the time. And I'll show you in a moment why that happens. But we also know that mindsets are particularly important for girls and for students of color. We can probably figure out why those students, more than others, don't believe in themselves as much. Um, I've been working with the PISA team in Paris at the OECD and really digging into the 2012 data set where they really focused on mathematics and they also looked really carefully at mindset. And I thought you might find this graph interesting. This has not been released, but you can find it if you dig into the uh, PISA data. But this tells us the percentage of students in that uh, data set of age of 15 year olds with a growth mindset. Norway, I have, to, sorry to say, is um, fourth from lowest, uh, the fourth lowest country in the world, or sorry, not in the world, of these 34 countries they looked at. And this also shows you the gender gap um, between girls and boys. So more boys in Norway have a growth mindset than girls, which is what we find typically across countries. So it's very important to change mindsets. They mean a lot. Um, so how do kids develop a fixed mindset? I don't know how many words you have for intelligence that are kind of fixed in this country, but in the English language, there are a lot of words that people are smart, that people are gifted, that they are bright. We have a number of words for it. And it turns out those words are damaging to students. So if, if you're, this is important if you're a parent, if you praise your children by telling them they're smart, what we now know is that what children hear is at first when they're told they're smart, they think, oh good, I'm smart. But then later when they mess up or fail, they think, oh, I'm not so smart. And they're evaluating themselves against this fixed notion. So this word is very commonly used amongst, with parents and teachers in the US. Everybody talks about who's smart, who's not smart. And that word is damaging. It is based on old ideas uh, that we are uh, really outdated. And we know that it is f students, uh, girls and women, having a fixed mindset is what keeps them out of higher level maths, STEM subjects in general. And it turns out that there's a reason that this idea that you're smart or gifted can be bad for you. It, it's, a, it's a bad idea if you get the idea you're, you have no gifts, that's not good. But it's also bad if you are given the idea that you're gifted. We now know that the kids who have that label suffer from it. And this is why, if you've been told that you're gifted, you have a math brain, you are, have some special genetic ability, and then you struggle on some mathematics, that struggle is absolutely devastating. And I wanted to tell you about two of my students at Stanford, one of whom was in my teacher program and she started in the summer. I was sharing this research on the damage of gifted ideas. And she said to me, that was my life. She said, I went to college all the time I was growing up as a child. My parents and my teachers said, you have a math brain. You're really special. You're you know, really gifted in math. And then I went to UCLA and I entered a math major. And in the second year of my program, I really struggled on, some, on a course. And so I dropped out of the math major because I thought I don't have a math brain. And that, uh, we find, is a very clear relationship. I teach undergrads at Stanford and in the class, we learn about this um, and we learn about mathematics differently. And this is from one of my undergrads. She said recently, I came into this class with a very evident misconception of maths and an abysmal math identity. When I was a child, I was told by some arbitrary tradition that I was smart at math. 
I was always told I had a gift or a talent, and I truly believed it. I struggled in my math classes at Stanford, so I decided I was not a math person after all, and I walked away from math. This is so clear, this relationship between believing you have a special gift and not being able to handle uh, struggling, that I think of it now as an algorithm. Um, it looks like this, and I, th I call this the worst math algorithm we have. And um, it's, it goes something like this. You believe you're a math person, you struggle, you no longer believe you're a math person, and you leave mathematics. <laughs> so this is really a serious issue for us to deal with, and um, why we're, it's really important to let go of these ideas of genetic special uh, ability. But um, other really interesting brain science that I thought you'd like to uh, think a bit about, and we heard a bit about this earlier too, is that we now know that when you make a mistake, amazing things happen in your brain. Uh, in this study by Jason Moser, they again had brain scans on people doing tests, and what they found was every time they made a mistake, synapses fired in the brain, but when people got qu questions correct, synapses did not fire, nothing fired. Um, <coughs> So the mistake, actually making a mistake, is, that, is a time when your brain is very active and it's very good for the brain. Now, when I share this with math teachers in the US, they say to me, but surely you have to work through the question and get it right. Uh, work through the mistake and get it right for your brain to grow. But no, actually what they found in the study was this. The first synapse came in the brain when people made a mistake. And then the second one came if and when they became aware they'd made a mistake. So then people say to me, how can your brain grow? How can synapses fire in the brain if you don't even know you've made a mistake? And the best knowledge we have on this is this synapses fire when you make a mistake because this is the time when, we, when your brain is challenged and when you're struggling. And even if you're not aware of it, this is a really uh, productive time for your brain. So this was also something from the same study that was pretty amazing. These are voltage maps of the brains in the study, like heat maps, showing activity in the brain. And what you see here is the orangey brain, is the brains of people in the study who had a growth mindset, who believed that it was good to make mistakes and who believed in themselves. And you can see that there were, what happened was there was a lot more brain activity for those individuals than for the people with a fixed mindset who didn't believe in themselves. And this shows something that brain scientists know, but I think the public doesn't know well, that is this. Our cog what we believe, what we feel about a subject and ourselves and our own potential actually changes how our brain operates and with cognition. And cognition and beliefs are very intertwined. So this starts, this sh helps us understand those graphs we saw with the children with a growth mindset always going onwards and upwards. Their brains are literally growing more, they are more active when they make a mistake than the kids with a fixed mindset. Um, and this also, I think, shows us something very important as t for teachers, for all learners, I know, I was a teacher, um, I know that it's one of the most challenging jobs in the world, it's also one of the most important, um, but it's challenging, and just like learners are challenged with maths, and I think what this shows us is if you go into challenging situations, and you think to yourself, I know I can do this, and then you mess up or you fail, your brain will respond more positively than if you go into that situation thinking, I don't think I can do this. It is very important that we have positive self-belief for you, um, for your students, for anybody who's learning and doing anything challenging. So um, I feel that in mathematics education, we've focused for so long on the best way to introduce content, how to introduce a fraction, and we have ignored the fact students are sitting in maths classrooms think, thinking to themselves, I'm not a math person, I can't do this. And until we change those beliefs, we will never have a high achievement for all students. So the second myth I want to talk about, that was the math brain. Uh, now, what I'd like to talk about is, uh, which we also heard a little from Hanan, is the 
idea that to be good at maths, you have to be fast at maths. This is also a myth. Um, some people who are good at maths are very fast, but there are some people who are very good at maths who are very slow. And one of them uh, that I like to share with school children is a mathematician who won the Fields Medal for mathematics and the highest honors you can win in mathematics. After he won the Fields Medal, he's a French mathematician uh, called Lauren Schwartz, and after he won the Fields Medal, he wrote an autobiography about his own learning of maths in school and how he felt stupid when he was in school because he was so slow. And this is from his autobiography. He says, I was always deeply uncertain about my own intellectual capacity. I thought I was unintelligent. And it's true that I was, and still am, rather slow. I need time to seize things because I always need to understand them fully. Towards the end of 11th grade, I secretly thought of myself as stupid, and I worried about this for a long time. I'm still just as slow. At the end of 11th grade, I took the measure of the situation and came to the conclusion that rapidity doesn't have a precise relation to intelligence. What is important is to deeply understand things and their relations to each other, and this is where intelligence lies. The fact of being quick or slow isn't really relevant. But we have students sitting in classrooms thinking that if they don't do maths quickly, they're not a maths person, um, and they can't do well. And in the US, we have awful things like this. You don't have these, have these here, right? Um, <laughs> this is uh, 50 questions to take in one minute given to students from first grade upwards. Um, when students do things like this, these timed high pressure assessments, it is the beginning of math anxiety for many, many students. And we now know how that process happens. So it turns out there's a very important part of the brain. It's called the working memory. And the working memory is where you process math facts. But if you feel stressed or anxious, the working memory doesn't work. Um, it's impeded or blocked altogether. So what happens when we give students things like this is many, many students become anxious. The working memory becomes blocked. They cannot produce math facts. And this, for many students, is the beginning of their thoughts at that they're not a math person. Um, I, you may have experienced this. I know I have. If you've ever been in a situation, maybe, maybe you're doing math publicly and everybody's watching you. Uh, maybe you're in a restaurant and your friends say, you're the teacher, you work out the tip, and they're all <laughs> watching you. And uh, you suddenly get the feeling of, oh my gosh, my mind has gone blank and I can't think. That is the impact of stress hitting the working memory. Happens uh, to everybody. And it's very important we detach maths from speed, it turns out. And it isn't only through time tests that we give the idea speed is important. Students will tell you that when teachers ask a question and they take an answer from the first student that shoots up their hand, they're giving a very clear message that speed is what's valued. So there are many ways we can pull back on that speed message, and it's very important to do that. Um, lecturers, I gave out a little essay to my Stanford students, and I said to them, tell me how it's going at Stanford so, so far. And they all wrote for me, and the thing that jumped out of all of their essays was the speed of the content. They wrote, you know, it's too fast, I feel like I don't belong. These are some of the most amazing, high-achieving students in the country. We know that lecturers speak at between 100 and 125 words a minute, but you can only write down up to 20. So when somebody's method of teaching, and this is more common probably in universities, is to lecture at the front, we have students sitting there trying to write everything down. They feel completely um, defeated often and don't get the opportunity to really understand mathematics. So we know that we want to dial back on speed. Depth is really important. Connections are really important. And those really work against speed. Interestingly, um, there's a lot more awareness now, which is great, that we want creativity. The most wonderful mathematics is more creative mathematics, as we'll see in a moment. Um, turns out that creativity is also inhibited by speed. And when we evaluate performance, when we give grades or rewards, that can increase very routine procedural thinking, but it decreases any creative 
or higher order thinking. So we have to really be careful about any systems that are based on speed and rewards. Um, this is a really interesting study that the Mindset team did. They were looking at little children in first and second grade, and they found even in that a at that age, the students with a growth mindset had a higher maths achievement, but they also found this, that the more any teacher focused on classroom performance, the more fixed mindsets developed over the school year. So, it, performance, um, it <coughs> turns out, a performance orientation is kind of the enemy of a growth mindset. And um, I, wrote, I wrote about this in a recent article that, uh, that was published in Time magazine, if you want to read more about that. But it also is important to know about anxiety, that you know, we know that lower achieving students have a lot of anxiety, but is that because they're lower achieving or the other way around? Well, it turns out it is the anxiety that causes low performance, and that anxiety is very important. You can see there it correlates greatly with how much people enjoy math, how much they take of maths. But this is really interesting, and I just published this also. Who is most harmed by maths anxiety? It turns out to be the highest achieving students. This graph shows you PISA performance in 10th percentiles. And every 10th percentile we go up, we see anxiety having a bigger impact on people's achievement. So, you know, we shouldn't even, we shouldn't think about this as being a problem of low achieving students. It's not, it's a problem of many, many people um, at level, different levels. So I have a small online class that I wanted to share with you that um, is designed to give people a growth mindset, to help them see maths as an open creative subject. We've had 160,000 students take it. It is in English, I'm afraid, um, and Spanish, but don't think that will help. Um, <laughs> and uh, this also turns out to be a really great thing to give to parents and to give to, and for teachers to take also. Anybody wants to translate it into Norwegian for me, we'd be happy to host that. But we just did a randomized controlled trial with this, giving this little course to students at the start of the school year. And we did, we had middle school teachers who taught two classes. They gave one class this course and the other class they didn't. And then at the end of the school year, we looked at the difference. They'd had the same teachers. There were over 1,000 students. The kids who took the course did significantly better on every aspect of the standardized mathematics tests. Um, they got higher school grade point average, math, science, and English language arts from taking this class. So here is a class about how to learn mathematics that improves people's performance in English and science. That's because it changes their mindset. And when you change your mindset, it has a huge impact. So it's very important to think about, is, my, is the orientation of my class really towards learning or performance? And I think a good way to measure this is to ask students, what do you think your role is in maths class? Many students, I'll ask that question, and they'll say, my role is to get questions right. When they say that, you know that their, their orientation is that they have to perform, they have to get things right. And I thought it was interesting, a colleague of mine told me her six-year-old son had come home saying he didn't like math. And she said, why? And he said this. He said, maths is too much answer time and not enough learning time. <laughs> so we can look at that and go, wow, that six-year-old is very reflective. But actually, kids know, and they know from a very young age that math is different, it's about performance, it's about answering questions. And what we teach teachers is tasks in maths class have to have space inside them for learning. If the point of a task is to give an answer, a calculation, that's a very fixed task that will give fixed messages to kids. But if the point of a task is for students to talk and draw and think uh, together uh, and learn, inside that task, then that is what will give them a growth mindset and a growth orientation. Um, so I want us to try this a little bit now with a task that you've already got in front of you. And um, I'd like you to think about this a little bit on your own first. And the task looks like this. And what we see here is there are, there's um, three patterns, three, it's a growing square pattern. And in case one, there's a small number of squares. In case two, there's more. And in case three, there's even more. 
And this is often given out in maths class with questions like how many, how many are in the hundredth case, or how many are in any case. But I would like you to think about it with a different question, and I would like you to think about it entirely visually, um, with no numbers at all. So ban numbers from your mind. I know this might be hard. Uh, don't think about it with algebra. Don't think about it with numbers. All I would like, what I would like you to do is think entirely visually. And my question is, where do you see the extra squares? So if you have a pen, you might want to draw on that piece of paper. And at first, do this on your own, and then I'll uh, ask you to talk to someone. But where do you see the extra squares? Think about that on your own for a moment, and then we'll talk. Does anybody need another piece of paper? So on your own. <laughs> which means no talking. <laughs> Where do you see the extra squares? <laughs> and then when you think uh, you've seen where the extra squares are, talk to people around you about where they see them and where you see them. So if I could get your attention, I'm sorry to cut off any good mathematical conversations. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to find out how you see this shape. And one reason I like this maths task a lot is I've given it out to many people, to teachers, to students, to CEOs of companies. Um, and everybody sees it differently. So I'd love to find out how you see it. I want to share with you some way, different ways people see it. And I always ask them not just to tell me how they see it, but also to describe how they see it. And this description came from my undergrads, who said they saw it like drops of rain coming down with the new squares um, being like a, dro a little drop of rain. Who saw it in that raindrop way? Could I see a show of hands if you saw the individual layering of... Um, it was also my undergrads who described this method as the bowling alley method, a row of skittles coming in um, each time, very different way of seeing it. Who saw it in this bowling alley way? Um, it was a teacher who said to me, I see it like a volcano, the center erupts and the lava comes flowing out from it. Who saw it in that volcano way, center leading volcano? Um, it was also a teacher who said to me, I see the parting of the Red Sea. The shape parts and a new uh, center comes in. And we see a duplication. Who saw it in this way, the Red Sea way? Um, some people see a growth of triangles. They look at the outside of the shape and see triangular growth. Did anybody see it in that triangular way? And that similarly, some people see the growth of the uh, empty triangles on the side, or what we call negative space in mathematics. Um, we, we see cultural differences with this, which is interesting. So this next method uh, was given to me by teachers in Boston on the east coast of uh, the country. 
We live on the West Coast where it's sunny and warm, but in Boston, they live where it's pretty cold. And um, they said to me, oh, it's like snow melting and the buildings start to emerge out of the snow. <laughs> I don't get that one in California, but... Um, and then one of my students this past summer said to me, I see the Minecraft tree. Um, I don't know if, how much you play Minecraft, but this is what he saw. The kind of sideways growth on the side. Who saw that kind of sideways growing? Um, and then, very interestingly, if you look at this method and you watch the red square on the left each time, you can see that we can rearrange the shape and it grows as a square. Who saw it in this square way? So this is what I want to illustrate with this maths question. When it's given out in classrooms, it's usually given out with a number question. How many? How many are in the 10th case, 100th case? How many are in the nth case? And it's used as a way of introducing algebra often. And what happens in those times is kids will count. So they'll say in the first case, there's four, in the second, there's nine, in the third, there's 16. They may stare down those columns for a long time and see that if you add one to the case number and square that number each time, you'll get the total number of squares, which is fine. Um, I gave this out to a room of teachers one day, actually, and one group of the teachers, a high school group, didn't listen to my request to think visually, and they did this. They drew up a table, they filled out the numbers, they called me over, they said, we're finished. Uh, they said, it's n plus one squared. And I said, okay, uh, why do you think it's squared? Why do you see that squared exponent? They said, uh, no idea. <laughs> so this is why you see that squared exponent. The shape grows as a square, and in fact it grows as one more than the case number each time. In case one, it's a two by two square, which is why we get that n plus one squared. We could have taken every different visual way people saw it, and they could have uh, described that visual method algebraically, and we would have a whole set of different algebraic expressions that are all equivalent. And when we do this task with students, we ask them these open questions. How do you see it? What happens is they have these wonderful, rich conversations about the growth, my fifth graders we taught, and sixth graders, they could tell you why it's n plus one squared. Uh, the high school teachers couldn't, but they could because they had seen it visually and they under understood that visual growth of functions. So it turns out, and I'll tell you more about this after the break, that thinking visually is very important and it's an opportunity for more creativity, for students are much more interested, and they get a deep understanding of functions that you don't get when you only deal uh, numerically. So just before we break, I wanted to ask you the question, why, do, why should we change our maths teaching? Uh, why not just lecture to kids and have them fill out exercises? Well, I could show you a lot of data about why we need to make these changes, but instead I want to share with you a YouTube video uh, made by a student in the US who felt inspired to put this little video um, to uh, the sound of his math teacher talking. Since our first equation tells us that y equals 3x plus 2, this means that we can substitute a 3x plus 2 in for the y in our second equation. In other words, since y means the same thing as 3x plus 2, we can replace the y in the second equation with a 3x plus 2. And rewriting our second equation, we now have 7x minus 4 times parentheses 3x plus 2. <coughs> Not as amazing as it may seem. We see many meerkats when we go out and watch uh, math classrooms, unfortunately. But, um, so my final thought before the break is this. The most beautiful part of mathematics, to me, is seeing the many different ways people, s people have ideas about maths, the different way, it's cut off there, people see mathematics, the different pathways they can be, that, that can be taken through any problem. This is a picture of me teaching sixth and seventh graders with a dot card, number talk, asking them how they saw it, and you can see, well, very faintly you can see the many different ways 
So when I teach my undergrads, we do mathematics together a lot, and they, well, if we give them more open problems in maths, what happens is they will all see it differently. They have different representations, they have different ways of solving it. And I say to them, this is what is lovely about mathematics. This is a really beautiful part of mathematics, often lost completely when children are going through school, using one method, one way. Um, so after the break, we'll come back to thinking a bit more about this in terms of the brain and have some more. Um, I'm going to share with you a little video we did of some teaching as well. So I think time for a break.